So today um, is not a formal lecture per se, but instead is an opportunity, hello. All right, thanks guys. Uh, so today we're gonna have a review session, just a quick uh, overview of some of the administrative issues having to do with the end of the class, uh, the exam on Monday. We'll talk a little bit about the, we'll give a study guide, basically talk about some of the issues that you might wanna review. There's a lot of material in this class, you know, talk about potential strategies for, um, you know, trying to get the most out of your studies. And then we'll open it up to questions, um, you know, let you guys ask if you have specific questions from the notes or the lectures, and then, um, and then we'll finish up. All right, so the first thing that I wanna point out is that uh, the final exam will be on Monday, this coming Monday from 1.30 to 3.30 here. Make sure to bring your photo ID. So when you turn in your exam, um, you know, we, we're gonna have people checking your photo ID. So make sure to bring your UCI student ID uh, to the exam, and um, we'll, we'll be checking that when you drop it off. In addition, it's closed book, um, and it's also closed notes, so no notes, no electronic devices. If you have a cell phone, I'm sure all of you do, um, make sure it's off. So, I mean, completely off, not just airplane mode, but completely off, and then stowed away in your backpacks, and the backpacks need to go to the side of the room. So we don't wanna have any um, potential, I'm sure this wouldn't happen with any of you guys, but we wanna make sure that you know, there's, no, um, there's no cheating going on. In addition, there's no consultation with your neighbors. Given that this is a closed book, uh, we wanna keep you guys you know, focused on, on doing your own work. And of course, that means you're also not on your phone with your stockbroker or what have you. Um, as I mentioned, you need to have a picture ID at the time of your submission at the end. And there will be a seating chart. So the seating chart will be posted here. In the back of the room on the right and left, just like the midterm. Just like the midterm. So we'll have uh, on either side. So when you come in, check those, and then that'll tell you where you're supposed to be sitting. Um, in addition, if you're, if you're left-handed, we've already got that information. So you, know, you, you supplied for, for that the midterm, yeah. for the midterm. Uh, you guys supplied that. So we know that and unless your handedness changed between now and the, the midterm, then we should be good to go. All right, so, um, so that's kind of the details about the final. And um, I have to show my little video here. Extra right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> a little levity always goes a long way. So uh, I mentioned this a couple days ago. We, we have extra credit, and it's basically um, to ensure that you guys provide an online evaluation for both myself and Dr. Fruman. Um, we, we take the, you know, your, your evaluations very seriously. We like the comments that you provide. Um, it, it helps us to kind of guide the course, you know, and, and is involved, you know, helps to evolve the course. In addition, in the comments this year, this is a new time for us. We haven't done this um, where we've done videos before. So if you have any specific comments about the videos, um, it'd be great if you could put those into, the, into your comments as well. So that, that definitely helps us. And for each evaluation that you provide to us, we, we actually get a, a you know, list of the students. We don't know what your evaluations are. We can't, you know, but we know who did the evaluations. So we can tell um, you know, that you guys did or did not do evaluation. So um, make sure that you, you, know, you guys have done this, make sure that those are for the final evaluations, not the midterm evaluations. And make sure that you complete the, you know, the evaluation and that you sign out. Uh, because we have no way of knowing if you, if you went in there and you meant to do the evaluation and it didn't happen, so we can't, we can't figure that out. So just make sure that you do that um, for both Dr. Fruman and I. And then uh, for each evaluation that you do, you'll get a, one extra credit point for a total of, of two if you do both. And the point of this is that we will provide you guys with those extra credit points after um, we establish the curve. So the advantage to that then is that you know, sometimes we'll have students that are like right on the line, right, basically between you know, uh, an A minus and an A or something like that, and that'll help to bump you up, uh, potentially could bump you up into the next grade, which, which, is, which is helpful. So um, yeah, so that's, that is useful. Any other comments about? Okay. Now the exam format is essentially identical in terms of the format. The questions are different, but the format is exactly the same as the practice exam that I, I posted online. Basically there are 20 true-false questions that will be worth three points each. You have 10 multiple choice questions uh, that are worth four points. And then there are nine fill-in-the-blank questions 
that are four points each, as well as eight short answers that are eight points each. So that totals up to, or should total up to 200 points. Okay, so this will be exactly double the value of the, of the midterm and, and um, it's actually a little bit, it's not double the number of questions. So it really should not be a time issue for you guys. Um, so hopefully, and in fact, in past years when we've done exactly the same format, we've seen a lot of the students will finish up early and, um, you know, go begin their, their holiday celebrations or preparing for the next, you know, final exam or what have you. So uh, hopefully time will not be an issue for you guys uh, as, you know, as the exam is not as long, at least uh, it's not double the, uh, the length of the midterm. All right, so there's, as I mentioned, there's a practice exam that uh, we've posted on the course website and this is a good way to test your knowledge. Basically, you can go through those, you know, do some study, try to go through all the notes, um, some of the, the concepts that we'll talk about in a minute, and then use this as a way of testing your knowledge. This is um, it's not something that you really wanna sort of practice the questions because we don't provide a key, and the reason why we don't provide a key is because we don't want you to be prepared for last year's exam. We want you to be prepared for this year's exam, and that will at least give you some idea of some of the questions that we're gonna ask. But all the information is available in your notes, um, so you should be able to find it there. I just wanna point out that I, uh... I changed the, the way that the lectures for the first half or so of the course were organized this year. So some things that were on last year's final were actually covered before the midterm this year, like antibody isotypes and distribution and function. And some things that were covered on last year's midterm, like uh, T cell receptor structure, MHC structure, MHC genetics, antigen processing and presentation, all came after the midterm. So last year's final won't have any questions really about those things. So that's why we're gonna give you a study guide. Okay. Any questions about the format of the exam, um, that sort of stuff? We're gonna go over some of the things to, to prepare for uh, at this point, but if you guys have any questions just about how it's handled. Okay. All right, so th questions are, you know, obviously what do you wanna study? There's a you know, big bulk of information here. How do you possibly get the most out of your limited study time? And so I'll hand it over to Dr. Fruman to start us off. So at the beginning of the course, I tell you that the final exam is cumulative, but it's really focused on what comes after the midterm. Just to re remind you, what I mean by cumulative is that the basic understanding of the immune system that you, that you acquire in the first part before the midterm uh, has to be there in order to do well in the second half. So if you don't know what a neutrophil is, you're going to ha have to know what a neutrophil is or a T cell. But uh, I'm not going to ask you specific questions about the... the uh, developmental pathway to a neutrophil like we had in the first half of the course. Uh, and as we go through these slides, it will highlight which parts of the, the first part of the course you need to review or at least have a good understanding of. But if you spend your time studying the details of chapters one through four and whatever else and not give yourself time to study the rest of it, that's going to, uh, that's going to be a problem. So this is just kind of a guide to remind you what big you know, major information you needed to learn in the first half of the course or third of the course. So cells of the immune system, still need to know all of them, they all came up later. Now all the cells reappeared later in the course, so it kind of applies to both. You need to know the, the function, we talked about all those in the second part of the course as well, particularly the thymus in terms of primary organ and all the lymph nodes and spleens and mucosal lymphoid organs. Um, you had your question on the midterm about innate versus adaptive immunity, we're not gonna reprise that, so that was kind of a disaster. Um, but if you don't understand, still understand the difference between innate and adaptive immunity, it'll be hard for you to understand uh, the hypersensitivity diseases and everything else you learned about in the second part of the course. In terms of antigen recognition, uh, we're, we're, I'm not going to ask you details about antibody-antigen interaction, but you have to remember things like, you know, T B cells can recognize intact antigens uh, and surface epitopes. T cells recognize peptides that can be derived from surface or internal epitopes. Uh, and you have to understand how that influences the ability of T cells to help B cells. And I believe you covered that for like certain vaccines where the B cell brings in the antigen through its antigen receptor and then receives help from a T cell because there's a protein linked to the antigen. What kind of antigens, or what kind of vaccines are those? Anybody remember what we call, we just did this a couple days ago. Anybody? Yeah. 
Conjugate vaccine. Conjugate vaccine. Good job. Right, so you can trick a B cell into, or T cell into helping a B cell make antibodies to a polysaccharide if the polysaccharide is linked to a protein. So this is a, such a fundamental concept of immunology that it's important for you to understand how that works. Uh, so antibody function, again, we covered that before the midterm this time, but I'm sure you applied a lot of this concepts, for example, an allergy with IgE uh, to, to really what their function is in immune responses uh, and where they are in the body. So just, just review those. It'll really help you understand immunology at the big, at the big picture. Okay, so now as far as the second part of the course, um, wait, I'm not sure that you... Yeah, these are still... Okay. Is this from last year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, this was from last year, so I, I think we put it in the front in the uh, coming later on. So for, for what you need to know about diversity generation from before, uh, it, what we talked about after the midterm was in terms of the germinal centers is where class switch combination and somatic mutation occur, but I'm not going to ask you the mechanistic details about the DNA events that occur there. So things you don't need to know from the first half of the course, um, details of phagocytosis, complement details, details of antibody structure. You've had your IgG uh, structure question. I just mentioned the DNA details here. We're not going to cover B cell development on the final or B cell tolerance or the, like, like I said, no details of antibody structure um, except what Dr. Walsh has put in here. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by this. 25% of questions on final exam? Yeah. From the first half of the course? Right. Okay, well. Well, uh, what I mean is not from the first half, but from the post, it should say post midterm. So 25% of the questions will come from Dr. Fruman and the rest will come from me. Yeah. I guess I could probably be a little bit more yeah. clear about 25 that. 25% of the questions from my portion after the midterm. So we'll fix that when you post this. So this is what you need to study. Is TCR structure? Um, and know that the VDJ recombination mechanism is similar as what we learned for antibodies. You need to know the T cell receptor alpha beta complex, including the uh, CD3 chains and the zeta chain uh, involved in signaling. Um, everything we covered in terms of MHC and an antigen presentation and processing, uh, why cells want to present antigens for different reasons, what T cells respond to peptides presented with class one versus class two, uh, where those peptides are derived from and what proteases and so forth generate them. Um, and here's a key one, which I emphasized as much as I could in our lectures, to understand MHC diversity. What is a gene family? Uh, why does that increase diversity of MHC? What are uh, genetic polymorphism and why MHC genes are, are polymorphic and where the polymorphism localizes? And then the concept of MHC restriction, which I'm sure came back later in the T cell uh, or T-cell activation lectures. So for the B-cell activation lecture, remember the distinction between a co-receptor, the B-cell co-receptor with uh, CD19 and CR2 that binds to complement fragments versus uh, like a, a co-stimulatory molecule like CD40. Again, in T-cells, the co-receptors are CD4 or CD8. They amplify the signal through the antigen receptor similar to the B-cell co-receptor. The co-stimulatory molecule CD28 on T cells, CD40 on B cells provides a second um, different signal. You need to re review the different types of antigens, T cell dependent antigen and T cell independent type one and type two. Uh, we talked a lot about where B cell activation occurs in the lymphoid organs, where antigens are encountered, how B cells then uh, meet up with T cells and what happens when, when T cells and B cells make conjugates. Uh, we didn't go into details about the germinal center architecture, but you need to know the, the consequences of the germinal center reaction, uh, specifically the functions of the, the follicular dendritic cells we did cover, and then just know that the outcomes are plasma cells that secrete antibodies and memory cells, memory B cells. So then, um, other things to know from my part, we started out with a discussion of T cell development and, and selection, including the, the double negative T cells that are um, getting into the cortex and the different stages that they go through to become uh, committed to T cells. And then the T cell receptor beta chain rearrangement and this process of beta selection where you have this pre-T alpha chain that comes out with, with the beta chain and leads to, um, 
to beta cells then moving on uh, in that lineage. We also talked about gamma delta cells uh, and then contrasted that with, with alpha beta cell generation. So how is it that you get a, de a gamma delta cell versus an alpha beta and what sort of rearrangements would you expect depending on how that works? We, we spent some quite a bit of time talking about the architecture in the thymus and the movement of T cells physically as they traverse through the, the, um, the thymus as they're undergoing development, different stages of development. We also talked about positive selection as well as this process of negative selection and how negative selection is very important for generation of what we call central tolerance. And then we spent time talking about the function of T cells and so sh you should know something about cytotoxic T cells. Uh, as well as helper T cells, so the cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells versus these CD4 positive T helper cells, as well as some of the, the helper subsets that we talked about, like Th1 uh, and Th2, and how they, uh, you know, the, the, the situations that these guys polarize, meaning they differentiate either into one subset or the other, as well as the um, unique functions of those and the, the cytokines that are involved in that. You should also know about. T cell trafficking, we talked a bit about how T cells traverse through, uh, through the blood and make their way to lymph nodes, uh, as well as some of the interactions between T cells and antigen presenting cells. Uh, peripheral T cell tolerance, so distinguished from uh, this concept of central tolerance and how uh, this peripheral T cell tolerance comes about and how it's important for, obviously, for prevention of autoimmune disease. Um, we spend a little bit of time talking about the immune synapse and, and T cell signaling, so you should probably um, go over your notes on that, as well as uh, the function of gamma delta T cells and what they recognize. And then we, we talked quite a bit about memory T cells, and you know we, we came up upon this concept that there are different subsets of memory T cells, the central versus effector cells, effector memory cells, and how they have uh, distinct uh, anatomical locations. And we also went over this experiment, the series of experiments that showed that antigen is not required for the maintenance of memory cells. So you should probably go over your notes and make sure you understand that. Then we spent some time talking about these natural killer cells or NK cells, uh, including these different receptors, both inhibitory and activatory receptors, like the NK G2D CD94. Uh, and these cures that are involved in recognition of, of MHC on the surface of cells. And importantly, what do these NK cells recognize and then what do they do if they recognize uh, something? We also want to spend time, uh, because we spent a lot of time in lecture talking about the immune response against infection. And so you want to know uh, obviously something, you know, how does the immune system respond to a viral infection? How does the immune system respond to bacterial infections? And what about the anti-parasite responses? And then we spent quite a bit of time talking about um, uh, immunity in mucosal sites, and in particular focused on the gut. And some of the, um, you should know some of the unique uh, immune structures there, as well as um, the, the, the signaling that's going on there. You should also know something about the T cell responses against different types of antigens, these non-peptide antigens like these lipid antigens that we talked about. And then we spent a few lectures talking about diseases that involve the immune system, um, including immune deficiency uh, and immune um, hyperactivity, whether that be uh, a hypersensitivity response or an autoimmune response. So you, sh you should understand the hypersensitivity responses. We actually spent two lectures on that, the first of which was entirely devoted to type one, which is allergy, and the second where we went through um, type two through four. So you should understand the potential causes and initiation of an autoimmune response and how that might be uh, provoked by a microbial infection. How does, how does uh, microbial infection impact um, tolerance such that you might develop an autoimmune disease? And then what distinguishes, this is an important question, what is it that distinguishes hypersensitivity from an autoimmune disease? Both of those are situations where the immune system kind of goes out of control and starts to attack our own tissues, but what is it that's different between those two? Um, and then the uh, factors that can lead to autoimmune and hypersensitivity disease susceptibility, as well as some of the tolerance mechanisms that break down and can uh, initiate an autoimmune disease. And then the last lecture we talked about vaccination, how you can manipulate, or the second to last lecture I should say, we talked about vaccination as a way of manipulating an immune response against um, microbial infection. And then uh, we also talked about organ transplantation 
and the mechanisms that are associated with allograft rejection. And we talked in particular about some of these different types of, of allograft rejection responses, like the hyperacute, uh, acute, and chronic rejections that are, um, in, in this case, the acute and chronic involving direct and indirect aller recognition. So you should be able to distinguish and understand the mechanisms that are involved in direct versus indirect aller recognition. And then finally, we talked um, at the end of the last lecture about immune suppression. What are some of the targets of immune suppression? Uh, how do they work? All right. So, oh, sorry. Can I just interrupt for a Yeah. Um, regarding uh, regarding type 1 hypersensitivity analogy, um, I came across a couple of uh, articles that I posted on the website this morning that are not required for you, but just of interest, maybe reading during Christmas holidays. Uh, one is a paper published in Immunity about the fact that the IgE response to bee venom is actually protective in a mouse model, so it's not just an annoying um, effect of, uh, a of, of anaphylaxis. And then the other is, a, is an article in the New York Times that discusses how we might avoid uh, getting out allergic and asthmatic at all just by going to milk cows on a farm. So it's pretty interesting. I see another advantage of milking cows. So. All right, so um, some other things to understand uh, would be to be aware of how activated T cells are, are armed uh, and then can exert an antimicrobial uh, impact. And the different pathways that are involved in Th1 versus Th2 generation uh, and function. And, and you know, we talked about some examples of where if the wrong choice is made, that ends up being a problem. So you know, go back, I definitely wanna review that. Study uh, this concept of, of leukocyte and lymphocyte trafficking and the, the types of receptors and ligands that are involved in that process, as well as understand some of the uh, conceptual bases for you know, the various immunological processes that we've, we've talked about. Uh, you know, for example, the, the evolution of an adaptive immune response, you know, the, the regulation of that, uh, and so forth. And then talk, you, you probably wanna review a little bit about how some of the microbes can basically thwart an immune response? How do they try to avoid immune detection? Some of the things that you do not need to know from my section include um, the basics of, of HIV replication, the, the proteins that are encoded by HIV itself, the virus, um, and you don't need to know every single detail about how HIV enters the cell. Um, you know, for example, the function of GP120 and, and GP41 that are involved in the fusion of the virion with the host cell. Uh, you also don't need to know all the details in terms of uh, the interactions between adhesion molecules. And you know, I give a lot of, of tables throughout my, my uh, presentations. You don't need to know every single detail in those tables. So you don't have to memorize all that, but really kind of get the overall uh, sense about what the table is describing. You know, for example, the different hypersensitivity responses uh, it might be a good idea to know, at least since we spent a lot of time on that, to know something about how each of those work and some of the, uh, the target organs, the target antigens, that kind of stuff. All right, so uh, we'll, we'll stop here with the, this, um, this overview, and I want to say thank you guys to, you know, for the fact that you've all been really, you know, really um, great kids, great, great students, I shouldn't say kids. You're not quite kids anymore, but you've all have been very, very courteous. You've had good questions, um, and you know we, we certainly appreciate your attention here. And we hope you've, you've learned something interesting about the immune system. Um, and again, I want to encourage you if you're interested in immunology, and, and hopefully you still will be after the final exam on Monday. Um, it's not just a two-hour window that you retain all that information. We have a class in the in the spring that Dr. Fruman will be teaching entirely by himself. No, I'm just kidding, both of us will be teaching. Um, I didn't wanna spring it on him here in front of everybody. So in that class is, is Advanced Immunology, it's M119, and it's really designed for, um, you know, obviously if you're interested in immunology, and we, we, we go through a lot of more, um, you know, into more detail in specific areas. You know, I, I cover a lot in immune tolerance and autoimmunity. Um, Dr. Fruman covers a lot in signal transduction and, and B cells. And um, it, there's a lot of paper, it's kind of a more paper-based uh, course. So you, you actually delve into the primary literature and I think a lot of the students really get a lot out of it. It's, it's, again, it's a challenging course, but you know, if you're interested in it, it's certainly um, something that you should consider. Okay.
So just a, a word about that course. Uh, it's a cap of 20 students, and priority is given to microimmunology majors. If you're so if you are one of those majors, you have to let us know that you're interested in the course. Just email me. If you're not and you try to sign up for it, it'll ask you for a, a code. Then you email me and I'll put you on the waiting list. Usually most people who want to get into that class do get into it, but there's a process involved. The process involves checks and uh, credit cards. Yeah. So you <laughs> Gifts. I need a Just new. Just kidding. <laughs> Before I... um, so the other thing is I'm not going to be here on Monday. I'm going to a professional conference. Unfortunately, it's in New Orleans, so it's not going to be any fun at all. But uh, um, so uh, Professor Walsh and the three TAs will be proctoring the exam. I won't be here. If you have questions about, que about the questions, and they look like they're my questions, uh, I've gone over them with, with Dr. Walsh, and so he can answer those questions for you, um, we hope. Uh, but uh, I tried to make them clear and avoid some of the confusion like we had with the innate versus adaptive immunity question uh, at the, on the midterm. All right, so I am open for questions. I have all the lectures here ready to be opened up. I'll start, maybe go for another five or 10 minutes, um, and then we'll go, go on and I'll leave and let Professor Walsh take over. So, yes. Yeah. So it's basically this slide here. What does that mean? Okay. Um, it's an antigen depot. It has complement receptors that trap immune complexes and store them for a long time on the ends of these long dendritic processes here. And uh, so they, these cells, they're not like classical dendritic cells. They're not hematopoietic derived. They just look like dendritic cells from these long extensions. And this is where the tr antigens are trapped. And they stay there for weeks at a time. And this is the, the depot or the, the source of antigen when B cells are undergoing somatic hypermutation and testing their ability to bind antigen. Uh, it's largely from interactions with the FDCs. I think that's. Yeah. I'll come back to it, promise. Adjuvants involve TLR ligands sometimes. We talked about that in my part. <laughs> Anybody? Bueller? Yeah. Can you Go ahead. Talk about power reactivity and when that happens? I, I, I can oh. I'll, I'll address that in a minute. Yeah, so I used to cover that in the MAC lecture, but I just decided to to cut that part out and let it come up later on. So, but in terms of MHC, I, t I talked about MHC polymorphism and how uh, essentially everybody's MHC haplotype is different from, from their neighbor. And so whatever the, the thymic selection processes are that go on in an individual to remove self-reactive T cells through central tolerance, they're not going to remove T cells that are reactive to somebody else's MHC. So usually, but one to 10% of your T cells are reactive with MHC of any other unrelated individual. That's allo reactivity. Yeah. When the dendritic cells implant the antigen, they say, say that there is an increased um, upregulation of the receptor called EC, S I G N. What's the function? That's his, yeah. So I, I gave three lectures the T cell receptor structure, MHC structure, antigen processing, MHC genetics, and B cell activation. That's what I'm here to answer questions about. Yeah. So I'm a little bit confused on genetic polymorphism. Okay. Uh, do you want me to just go over it again? Please. So this is a good figure to review because it illustrates both gene families and genetic polymorphism. Uh, gene families means that there's three genes for class 1 MHC and three pairs of genes for class 2 MHC. Forget about HLA, E, F, and G, and HLA, DM, and DO for this particular discussion. Uh, and so every, every cell that expresses class 1 is going to have uh, three different genes all expressing at the same time. So you'll have three different class 1 alpha chains all pairing with beta 2 microglobulin. So that's gene families, similar concept for class 2. But 
because the population is diverse and there, there are hundreds of different alleles for each class one, let's just stick with class one for now, that means that uh, typically uh, the paternal allele and the maternal allele are different. They have different structures in the regions that contact peptide and key cell receptor, and both alleles are expressed at the same time. So you have two different alleles for HLA-A, two different for HLA-B, and two different for HLA-C. That means almost everybody is heterozygous for each of the three genes. So polymorphism accumulates in, and, uh, in the population, and so there's a lot of different alleles for MHC class one, and the same is true for almost all the class twos as well, with the exception of DR alpha. Uh, and then we came back and we talked about where's the polymorphism, and again, focusing on class one, polymorphisms, in other words, changes in the gene leading to a different allele tend to accumulate here in the regions that contact the peptide or that face up towards a T cell receptor. They do not accumulate in the alpha-3 region that might contact the CD8 protein or beta-2 microglobulin, but they're more likely to be deleterious here. If a, if a new mutation appears that changes peptide binding or T cell receptor binding, it might be helpful, it might not, but it's not going to have a big change in fitness, and they tend to just accumulate in the population over time. So polymorphism, you just need to know two basic things, uh, which is that it mainly affects the regions of contact peptide and T cell receptor, and that it ensures that most people are heterozygous for each uh, gene in each gene family, and that increases the diversity of MHC you can express so that the, the universe, you cover a larger part of the universe of peptides available from any particular antigen or any particular pathogen, I should say. Is that enough of an explanation? Any other questions for Dr. Freeman? All right. Okay. Hey, good luck, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Professor Freeman. All right, uh, so we had a question about alloreactivity. Um, so we talked about that, I think that was the second to the last, no? Let's see, that's vaccines. So the point of alloreactivity is really when you, if you're doing something like a transplant where you have um, somebody where, you know, Dr. Freeman was just talking about these differences, these polymorphisms that are associated with MHC. And if you do a transplant where you have a person with disparate MHC, you're going to have T cells there that have the ability to recognize that. And the point of that, the reason for that is that T cells, like when we were talking about positive selection in the thymus, the T cell receptor uh, is, is basically selected for its ability to bind to MHC. So, so the T cell receptor needs to bind to, to MHC and there's a certain amount of signal that is, you know, that that alone is gonna provide to that T cell to, to allow it to survive. Uh, moreover, we know that, you know, over throughout ed, evolution, the T cell receptor genes have evolved in a certain way to be able to bind very avidly to, um, to T cell receptor has been capable of binding to MHC very, very avidly. So the point of that is that if you if you take somebody else's MHC and you put it in to um, a different into a graft recipient, that recipient will have T cells that have never been negatively selected against those those MHC. And so if there's enough signal, if there's enough um, interaction that's set up between that um, that disparate MHC and that T cell receptor, then you're going to get activation of that T cell, and then the consequence is that you'll get a um, an allogeneic response. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, can you go over the, the IgM um, titer, how it goes down after immunization and IgG goes up? How does that competition happen? How does the competition happen? That was in, which lecture was that? You remember offhand? Okay, let me see if I can remember. That, that's when we were talking about the antiviral response, right? 
So I'd probably be 16 or 17. Well, I think the point that I was trying to make with that was that when you have, that, that's with respect to vaccination where you do boost, right? And so the point of that was that with, with um, on the first antigen exposure, the, the B cells that are gonna be there are, are gonna be basically having low affinity antigen receptors, low affinity immunoglobulin against whatever the antigen is in, that's in the vaccine. But if you boost it over time, what's, what's happening is as long as you're also providing some T cell help, you're gonna get somatic hypermutation, you're gonna get affinity maturation. And so the result of that is that you get higher and higher affinity over time. And so IgM, you don't have that because you also have at the same time, you have this, this class switch recombination that's gonna take place. So your low affinity initial antibodies that you have are of the IgM type, but once these B cells start to once they become activated, they're no longer naive B cells, they tend to switch to one, you know, IG, IgD, IgG, one of the IgGs, what have you. So over time, that refines, and that's the reason why IgM stays relatively low affinity, but your IgG, uh, as, as particularly over time, as you're boosting with a particular vaccine, you tend to see higher and higher avidity antibodies that show up, as well as they're, they're class switching to IgG. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so great, thanks. It helps me. I probably should label these at some point so that I know what I'm looking at, what I'm searching for. Um, yeah, so the, the point of that was that um, NK cells, I mean, one of the functions of these NK cells is, is to be able to recognize whether a cell is downregulated MHC on the surface. And if you think about it, why would they want to do that? Well, that's a great evasion strategy to try to avoid, you know, if you're a, a virus, for example, you want to avoid detection by the immune system, so why not just, you know, make sure that none of your peptides are presented to the T cells by downregulating MHC? And so the immune system the, through these NK cells has figured that out. And, um, you know, there, there's a few of these, what we call inhibitory receptors, one of which is the CD94 NKG2A. And this receptor on the surface, what it does is it, it, it has the ability to detect if there is a difference in, in presentation of any of the um, HLA, A, B, or C uh, class one molecules on the surface. And the way that it does that is um, it's, not, it's not binding directly to A, B, or C, but instead it binds to this HLA E. And in order for E to get out to the surface, let me, um, let me zoom this up. So the way that that works is that in order, so, so as these uh, HLA, A, B, and C molecules are, are being produced, they're produced inside, here, inside the ER here, and they have a little um, hydrophobic leader sequence. Just like any protein that's destined to the, the secretory pathway, they have that little hydrophobic leader. That comes off and then it, it's bound up by HLAE. And so if HLAE is bound to one of these, these leader sequences from A, B, or C, then it can make its way out to the surface and then present that to CD94 NKG2A on an on a NK cell. And so the purpose of this is that um, this basically blocks the activation of this NK cell and, it, and the NK cell is not gonna kill that cell. So, you know, maybe the question is, well, why, why would you do it that way instead of just directly recognizing A, B, and C? Maybe that has to do with polymorphism. Maybe it's because of the way that this is interacting uh, that, it, that it doesn't need to do that. But the important point is that um, this, this inhibitory receptor here does not directly recognize, you know, classical class one MHC. It recognizes this class E molecule. Does that make sense? And I should also say that there's another one, which another set of receptors, which are called these, these killer uh, immunoglobulin-like receptors or cures. And they, uh, instead, they can recognize specifically um, MHC A, B, and C, and in particular, as I mentioned, um, they have differences between A, B, and C in terms of, of that binding, but those guys directly bind it. So, so those are a different class of inhibitory receptors that NK cells will use to recognize MHC expression. Yeah. Previous slide. Uh, is this peptide on HLAE for, uh, uh, an antigen that's derived from inside the cell? You mean like a? I'm asking about the HLAE. Oh, this? What's the difference between that one and the MHC 
oh, well, this is probably some, you know, some cell, cell some autoantigen or something like that. The difference is this is actually uh, from class one, two, or three. It's one of those, those um, signal peptides that's actually from A, B, or C. And if it's not there, you know, so let's say that the cell is infected with some virus that targets HLA class one expression, then those peptides are, are not gonna be there because, you know, this virus has shut down class one expression, right? So the consequence of that is that HLA-E will not be loaded with that peptide. And as you guys learned in Dr. Freeman's lectures, it's also not gonna traffic appropriately to the cell surface. So it needs to be bound to a peptide to be able to make it. And E is, is specific for uh, that, that leader peptide from A, B, and C. Yes, it's a it's one of the the or one of the um, the genes for that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, uh, is this receptor uh, the CD ninety four K G two A? Is that similar to the KIR in which, in which it just it binds to a very specific sequence on the, on the MHC, or does it recognize the whole thing for HLA? Uh, so this this has a certain recognition platform where it's recognizing E. So in in general, this is a way of uh, of sampling just total class one expression on, on, that's being expressed by that cell. So the whole thing, not like just 77 to 83 for KRs? Oh, well, the, yeah, so this is not gonna be as specific as the KRs, but, but certainly there's a region of that molecule that, that needs to be bound. So it's, it's not recognizing the entirety of the class one molecule. It has a certain uh, binding domain, but it's, it's binding in an invariant, a non-polymorphic part of that, of, of E. Yeah. Sorry, 13? No, it's, I think it's Richard 26. 20. What was it? I'm sorry, what, I, what was the question? Upregulation of MHC during inflammation. Well, just, just what, what's the question? So the question is, wh why do you get upregulation of MHC? So some pro-inflammatory cytokines like uh, interferon gamma can actually target the expression of class one. So the result is that if a cell is experiencing, you know, if there's some sort of infl inflammation going on, cells that would normally have pr low expression of class one, they'll upregulate it. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Where does IL-7 come from during T cell development? They, T7, they were dependent on not signaling. Uh-huh. IL-7, but where does the IL-7 come from? It comes from the stromal cells. Okay. Yes. Over, um, epitope spreading. Epitope spreading, okay. <clears throat> Okay, so epitope spreading is this idea that as a autoimmune disease starts to evolve that you know, it may be precipitated by a single antigen, but that over time, um, because of the inflammation that's going on, you start to get more and more epitopes involved, self-epitopes involved. And an example that I provided was um, for both T cells, and then I provided a separate example for B cells. So in this case here, um, this is in the case of lupus, where oftentimes you have these antibodies that are anti-nuclear. They bind to DNA or histones, things that are, that are present in chromatin. And so let's say here you have a piece of chromatin uh, that's got DNA and it's got a histone, you know, these nucleosomes with a, that are made up of these histone proteins. And so let's say that you have a, a T cell here, a CD4 T cell that can provide help, and it is specific for uh, histone H1, okay. Now, this B cell has on its surface a receptor for H1, and so this is what we consider a standard cognate, cognate interaction between a T cell and a B cell specific for the same antigen. And so, so that all makes sense. But you start to see epitope spreading because now you have a, a B cell that, say, comes along, and it's specific for, let's say this one is specific for DNA, this one's specific for histone H2, this might be ribosome specific, 
The point of this is that because the B cell, it's kind of like a little vacuum cleaner, right? It's got this, this antibody molecule on the surface that's antigen specific. It picks up a piece of this, this chromatin, takes it up inside the cell, and it's not just H1 that's going to be presented on MHC here, but it's also all these other proteins that can be presented by MHC. So now you start getting, um, now you start getting uh, all, all sorts of other um, uh, things that can be presented. And so this T cell, because of the fact that these, these B cells are taking up this complex, um, even if this B cell was, let's say, over here, where it's spe specific for H2, it's, it's still capable of binding to this, the complex, and, and that complex is going to have some of this H1 that can be processed and presented to this T cell. So this T cell that's only specific for one epitope now can provide help for all these different epitope, these, these B cells that are specific for epitopes in that complex. All right, so that's the case for the B cell, for, for a, a single T cell allowing epitope, epitope spreading for B cells. And that's also true for a single B cell uh, leading to antigen presentation for a bunch of different T cells. So here again, let's say you have this, this H1 specific B cell, it's picking up these um, uh, complexes of chromatin by virtue of binding to this H1, this histone H1. And then that then is processed inside the B cell. And now you have peptides not just for H1, but also for you know, these other histones and other associated proteins. So now you have a T cell that comes along. Here's the cognate interaction. So the B cell is H1 specific, as is this T cell. But then there's also these H2 peptides. And so now a T cell comes along that's specific for the H2. And so the consequence is that now you start getting epitope spreading of the T cells as well. And, and the key for this, I think, is this idea that there's a complex. The B cell can recognize this complex, act as this little vacuum cleaner and start to spit out these different peptides and then provide help to all these different types of, of T cells. So is it because that chromosome has these different proteins that's able to present those different fragmented proteins? Right, so, so it, the, exactly. So the reason why the T cell can do this or the, the, uh, the B cell can do this, present all these different antigens, is because there are all these different epitopes associated with that complex. All right. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, mixed lymphocyte reaction, huh? Yeah. Do you want a civilian T cell proliferation and C2L as possible? You, you, uh, the, yeah, if you're, if you're a physician and you want to do, you want to do, do a transplant, you want to see as little T cell activation as, as possible. And you can measure that either by looking at proliferation or CTL activity. Exactly. Yeah, way, way back there. Yeah. Yes. I don't All right. Let's see if I can remember which lecture that was. Let's see. It's 19. 19. Okay, thank you. All right. So this um, this experiment is basically set up to try to address this question as to whether once a memory cell is developed does it still need to have continuous stimulation? Does it need to see that antigen in vivo to maintain it? And the, this is kind of an important question because, you know, memory cells can give us lifelong protection. They need to have, you know, possibly they may need, need to have some interaction with the antigen to kick those guys off. Um, but, you know, what this experiment did was basically to take mice, <clears throat> and in the first experiment, they're basically infecting a mouse with virus, um, they find that any rechallenge of this mouse, um, they're, they're protected. Even if they come along with a particularly virulent strain of the virus, because they have these memory cells, these memory T cells, that protects the mouse. So how do they know that there's, there's no viral antigen that's required to keep these cells alive? So here in a second experiment, they take a mouse which, which has been infected, and then four weeks later they take out the, the CD8 T cells, which pr presumably have some of these would be memory CTLs. They put that into a naive mouse. This mouse has never been exposed to LCMV. And then they, in this naive mouse that you then wait for one to two years, so this is a really long experiment, um, and then you see whether or not these guys can make a, a, a memory response. So um, are these cells still functional in vivo? So the, the third experiment 
uh, is a little bit different because here they're just basically taking the mouse and then doing this adoptive transfer and then looking to see whether there's, um, you know, if you do a challenge in this to see whether there's uh, an antiviral response. But here, the difference is that you take a mouse, again, you adoptively transfer memory CTLs after four weeks into a naive mouse. You wait for a year, and this mouse has, has gotten, um, let's say this mouse has gotten the memory CTLs. This is a, a new mouse that's never gotten that adoptive transfer, so it doesn't have the memory T cells. And then you, you, you challenge these guys with a particularly virulent strain of the virus. These mice that have never, they don't have the memory cells, they succumb to the viral infection, so they die off. But these guys that, that had gotten this adoptive transfer of the memory cells, they survive. So the, the important point of this is just to show that not only do you have the memory cells there, not only do those memory cells still exist based on just, you know, uh, memory cell markers, but on top of that, there's actually functional memory. So you can show that the mouse is protected um, as a result of that. And unfortunately, we're gonna have to end it there because I gotta let our cameraman go. So the first thing I'd like you guys to do is, is to um, uh, thank our, our cameraman. Unfortunately, Shant isn't here today, but um, you know, we've been able to get some great help by these guys. And, um, and if you guys have any other questions, I, I, I've been going through the post there. And um, again, thanks for your attention and uh, uh, we'll see you guys on Monday. Thank you.